when I think of our golden era of space exploration, the late 1950s, right on up through the early 1970s, over that time, very few weeks would go by before there would be an article in a magazine where a cover story would extol the city of tomorrow. I mean, why wouldn't we want a community of the future to be self-sustaining and energy independent? The same energy generation and recycling techniques that could have a powerful impact on surviving on the moon could also have a powerful impact on surviving on the Earth. And people love that. They think you're naive to be optimistic, that we are going to make the future better than the past. We are going to figure out our problems, and we're going to get past them. What's your... Project? My project's on reducing carbon emissions, and I chose to do so with nuclear. And I talk a bit on the oil sands, on how nuclear can help, for example, generating the steam for SAG-D. People were mostly interested in the lifter, talking about the thorium. They like that better as an alternative, because uranium really has a bad rap. Oh, has it directed you in your life, in terms of... I want to be a nuclear physicist. You do, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to be a music teacher. I had my, my heart set on it. Uh, That's what I went to school for, music education. When I heard about thorium, uh, and I just thought to myself, okay, m music, it's great, I love it, but it's, it's just insignificant to the challenges that the human race is, is experiencing. Because of my former experience as a reactor operator for the U.S. Navy, I, I got it. I understood it right away. I made a two-minute video for a science video competition. In the 1950s, Alvin Weiberg, director of Oak Ridge National Labs, was tasked with building a nuclear reactor. Today we learned we could run this type of reactor on thorium. I've been trying to get people in my generation to do the good stuff that needs to happen on energy issues for 30 years. The title of my talk is Thorium and Molten Salt Reactors, Improving Public Knowledge and Awareness. With us being in chemical engineering, we have a background in liquid-liquid extraction. The fission products are more soluble in the bismuth stream than in the salt stream, so they will be transferred when they contact. It was nice to finally have a technical audience. Yes, yes. Oh my really gosh. Yeah. It's going to be up to you guys, you know, like you, you high school students and you college people, to pull us out, you know, so you can do good for my grandkids and everything. And, and you know what? They get it. They know it. I didn't grow up around, oh, we got to fight the Russians, we got to fight the communists, you know? You don't have that searing image of a mushroom cloud in your head, probably. No, no absolutely yeah. not. You know, I really want to work on Lifter, I really want to work on thorium technology. I know everybody I talk to about this technology, like, we're all engineers, so we're kind of geeky that way. But everybody's super excited about the potential in here, because yeah. it's really quite cool. We're going to try and get a teacher in every single school to teach molten salt chemistry and molten salt class. I'd love to see y'all here, but it's, it's for me. It, it's for me and it's for my children. And, and I'd love to see more companies coming up with codes, coming up with reactor designs. And I would love to jump on board. My desire when I was a younger man was to get involved in alternative energy. Uh, I hadn't really seen anything about uh, thorium or molten salt reactors at all. And that TED talk was the one where Kirk was in town talking about lifters. Thorium has an electromagnetic signature that makes it easy to find even from a spacecraft. Here's an actual map of where the lunar thorium is located. When I pitched this story to Wired Magazine, there's six editors around a table and they're pretty well informed science and technology journalists and not a single one of them had heard of thorium. We were working on nuclear engines, we were working on really far out stuff in this buddy of mine's office. He got a book on his shelf, and the book was called Fluid Fuel Reactors. He used to work at Oak Ridge National Labs in Tennessee, and he said, I just went to the library, and I got this old book. It was written in 1958. I've been meaning to look through it. I said, well, hey, can I borrow this book? Big old thick book. It was like a 1,000 pages. Oh, boy. I mean, <laughs> But it was intriguing enough to me, and it seemed really different than the kind of nuclear energy we had now. And they also mentioned in this book a lot about thorium. Thorium, thorium, thorium. I was like... Dude, what the heck is thorium? Thorium is a naturally occurring radioactive substance found just about everywhere on this planet. We have lots and lots of thorium, and it has some unique properties. One of them is if you hit thorium with a neutron, the thorium will absorb the neutron, and it will turn from thorium-232 into thorium-233. It's going to decay into protactinium-233, and then it will decay over about a month to uranium-233, Uranium-233, if you hit it with a neutron, it will fission. In addition to releasing all that energy, it will release two or three additional neutrons. 
All right, so you need one of those neutrons to go find another thorium, and you need another one of those neutrons to find another uranium-233 to continue the reaction. You're fissioning uranium-233, but you're making a new one. But you can almost think about it as a pseudo-catalyst. If you had some uranium-233, you could catalyze the burning of thorium indefinitely. When shipping port was shut down for the last time in 1982, the examination showed there was more fissile material, more uranium-233 in the fuel than there was when they started. Thorium breeding worked. It was actually done and demonstrated. Not in a molten salt reactor, but in a light water reactor. Well, you're really coupling two different technologies as far as history proving them out. You have shipping port that proved the thorium fuel cycle, and then you have molten salt reactors that proved the liquid fuel form. The Oak Ridge plan was to couple, I mean, they, they designed the MSRE for a thorium fuel cycle. It, it was their design, it, didn't it was do plan, it. but they never got there. They never got there, but it was, I mean, it wasn't like somebody said, oh gee, let's put thorium in MSR. Never thought of that before. Today's reactors are fueled by a rare isotope of uranium, uranium-235. To fuel a reactor with abundant material is called breeding. Breeder reactors take naturally common isotopes and turn them into man-made isotopes that can be split apart to release energy. Shipping port was a breeder which used pressurized water as a coolant. To combine pressurized water with the breeding of nuclear fuel is a particularly expensive approach. With breeder reactors, coolant choice greatly impacts the cost of operation, even more so than with inefficient non-breeders. The real object of this reactor is to learn about pressurized water reactors for atomic power. It will not be cheap to operate. It will be no cheaper to operate than Wright's Kitty Hawk would have been to carry passengers around. At the present time, reactor design is an art. It's not a science. We are trying to make a science out of it. Shipping Port's thorium fuel load was a proof of concept and not an economic breeder design. At Oak Ridge, Wigner saw molten salt as a way of economically breeding natural thorium into uranium-233. At Argonne, Fermi saw liquid metal as a way of economically breeding natural uranium into plutonium. Both uranium and plutonium can be and are, of course, peacefully used and, and alleviate a great deal of human suffering, but I must admit there is that lingering notion of how they were used terribly in weapons at one time that it does make it difficult for the public to uh, uh, sort of accept forms of energy that, that had that connection. And, and uh, thorium, fortunately, was never, was never employed in that manner, and so probably has a neutral feeling in, in most people's minds. They don't really have an opinion one way or another about thorium any more than they might about dysprosium or something else on the periodic table. Nine, 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 nine. Well, this was wartime. Their plan was to make bombs. They took natural uranium and they separated those two isotopes. They would highly enrich uranium-235 from less than 1% up to like 90 plus percent. Took big factories, very difficult to do isotopic enrichment. But this is how they made the uranium for the first nuclear weapon used in war. This was the bomb at Hiroshima. It was called Little Boy. Then they said, well, what can we do with all this junk uranium-238, the 99.3% of it? You could expose it to neutrons, and you could make it into plutonium. Now, plutonium is a different chemical element than uranium, so they can be chemically separated. Uranium-235 and uranium-238 are like identical chemically. There's no chemical difference between them. But there is a chemical difference between plutonium and uranium, so it was a lot easier to do a chemical separation of the plutonium you'd made, and that's how they made the Nagasaki bomb, which was called Fat Man. Okay, well maybe we can do the same thing with thorium. Maybe we can expose it to neutrons and we can make it into uranium-233. Uranium will be chemically separable from thorium and we can go make a bomb out of it, right? Sounds great. It's a really bad idea because as you made the uranium-233, you were always making uranium-232. You didn't make a lot of it, you only made a little bit of it. But uranium-232 is much more radioactive than uranium-233. Here's the decay chain that uranium-232 is on. It jumps down to bismuth-212 and thallium-208. And these two decay products put out very, very strong gamma rays. 
And these gamma rays are just super bad news if you want to go and build a practical nuclear device because they tell everybody where the stuff is and they kill you. So really quickly they were going, okay, we can work with uranium-235, that seems okay. We can work with plutonium, that seems okay. But this uranium-233 stuff, that's bad news for making a nuclear weapon. So thorium was just set aside. PG-13. Well, after the war, they picked up on this again because now they were thinking, let's talk about making power instead of making nuclear weapons. And so what happened is they put resources into the plutonium breeder reactor almost from the get-go. They built the experimental breeder reactor one in 1951. So this is the first reactor that made electricity. Four little light bulbs here. This was a breeder reactor. It was designed to convert plutonium into energy while making new plutonium. This was not a light water reactor. This predated the light water reactor by years. Early nuclear pioneers like Enrico Fermi and Eugene Wigner saw the future quite a bit differently. Fermi believed that we should really focus our efforts on the fast breeder reactor. Eugene Wigner, on the other hand, reached a different conclusion, which was that thorium was a superior fuel and this opened up a number of possibilities with coolants and reactor configurations. They by and large said, we're gonna go the plutonium route. And one of the reasons why was they had developed a great deal of understanding about plutonium from the weapons program. They had made the stuff, they had worked with its chemistry, they'd made fuel out of it. They go, we get this. Thorium, we haven't really messed with thorium. You know, it would be like starting over. So that propensity there was to go and do what you already knew how to do. And the plutonium was so much better developed than the thorium. Because the liquid metal fast breeder uses liquid sodium as coolant, and because sodium has a higher boiling point than water at atmospheric pressure, the coolant in a liquid metal fast breeder does not need to be pressurized. Pressurized water reactors are really thick pipe, whereas here it's relatively thin pipe. Both types of breeder reactors, the liquid metal fast breeder and the molten salt breeder, can avoid the cost and complexity associated with containing pressurized water coolant, which may flash to steam. However, the chemical stability of molten salt coolant and the ability of molten salt to secure radioactive isotopes within strong chemical bonds is not shared by sodium. It's stored under an oil to, to stop air or moisture getting on it. Reacts very, very quickly with air and also with water. Or well, the hydroxide is a white crust on the outside. All right, go. Oh, Catch oh, and then it explodes. They built a reactor and put it in a sub, and they end up cutting the reactor out of the sub and putting the LWR in it. But they became disenchanted with sodium cooling rather quickly. What happens if there's a leak? Sodium reacts with the air and the water. Well, you haven't got air next door to your sodium surfaces. It's inerted. With liquid metal fast breeders, the advantage of a coolant operating near atmospheric pressure must be weighed against the use of that same coolant, which also reacts rapidly to air at high temperature and violently to water at any temperature. Milt Shaw wanted Alvin Weinberg and Oak Ridge to get on the fast breeder funding wagon and that Weinberg wanted to stay on with thorium and molten salt. Well, it was pretty obvious that Shaw was completely convinced LMFBR with its sodium cool system was going to be successful. If we have a winner here, why spend money on what we know is going to be the loser? This breeding principle holds the key to the efficient use of our atomic fuel resources of uranium and thorium. This atomic power plant in Michigan is named after Enrico Fermi, a breeder type of reactor. Great amounts of research and testing go into the designing and construction to make them efficient and, above all, to make them safe. Breeder reactor has taken on a strongly negative connotation. 
1966, a liquid metal breeder reactor suffered a meltdown. This incident led to the book and song, We Almost Lost Detroit. However, in 1986, 20 years after the accident, another liquid metal breeder reactor, running at full power, underwent a controlled system blackout. We took EBR2 to 100% power and we gagged the safety system so the emergency control rods would not go in if they were told to. And then we turned off the main coolant pumps. And you pulled on your helmets. Well, it sounds dangerous, but it wasn't. No control rods were inserted. No human intervention was involved. They just turned off the pumps and waited. The temperature climbed, held, and then began to drop. The core tends to expand thermally a little bit as it heats up. The fuel expands, the clad expands, the core support structure expands, the core plate underneath expands. And now more neutrons leak out and don't contribute to the chain reaction. And now there's natural circulation going on inside this big vessel. We can design it so that natural air circulation on the outside would occur. So you would actually never ever need to take operator action. The trouble is these tests were done about two weeks before Chernobyl. Yes, that's right. That was so no one, yeah. no one even knew about this, which yeah, is a yeah, shame. Yeah. Bob? Uh, this, this was not commercialized, yeah. right? We were going to, it was called Clinch River. I was working on Clinch River. And then... We're eliminating programs that are no longer needed, such as nuclear power research and development. This administration does not support the Department of Energy's Advanced Liquid Metal Reactor Program and will oppose any efforts to continue the funding for this reactor project. In 1994, during the Clinton administration, the last American breeder reactor program was canceled. This is not a dream. This is real. We know how to do these things. Nobody saw the light water reactor as the machine on which we would power our civilization using nuclear power for thousands of years. The only question is which breeder and how fast do we get to it? I mean, I got a 1962 report to the president, and right in there it states, this is a stopgap technology. I think these early nuclear pioneers would be absolutely floored to show up today in our nuclear world and go, oh my gosh, you're still using light water reactors? I mean, come on, guys. We should have seen more technology advancement by now. We should have seen something better. Successful breeder reactor tests have never been publicly celebrated. The advantages outweigh the difficulties. You can handle this molten salt reliably, and when things go wrong, we were able to fix. The concept is ultimately going to be a practical application. Cancelled, plutonium, and meltdown would be the words most commonly associated with breeder reactor. Pandora's promise came out, and they're, they're talking about the fast reactor. Is there any uptick in interest in this now? I think it has uh, motivated some people who had been either skeptical of nuclear or, or were anti-nuclear to rethink. So I'm Robert Stone. I'm the director of Pandora's Promise, which is a documentary that chronicles the conversion of a number of high-profile environmentalists from being anti-nuclear to pro-nuclear. And their process of conversion on this issue very much mirrors my own. On opening night, I polled the audience. I was surprised that 20% actually admitted to being pro-nuclear at Sundance, but they, they raised their hands, Q&A after the film, and I asked the same question. And that was the response. Until Pandora's Promise in 2013, there was no compelling video explanation of the liquid metal reactor's safety test for the public to digest. That same year, a video of molten salt researchers was posted to YouTube explaining how the molten salt reactor experiment safely compensated for an equipment malfunction thanks to the passive safety enabled by molten salt. Molten salt is inherently safe and, you know, self-controlling. Just about any molten salt concept that has been seriously considered has been shown to have this stable behavior. This is an old facility. Look down before you walk. That's our biggest hazard here right now. Oh. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've modeled this shape neutronically. It is oh. like a lead pencil, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Basically.
We just returned from a trip to Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and one of the exciting things that the Baroness and I got to do was to tour the molten salt reactor experiment, which was uh, one of these type of reactors that was built in the 1960s. Decades ago, we successfully demonstrated passive safety features of the competing breeder reactors. We took EBR2 to 100% power, then we turned off the main coolant pumps. The fuel expands, the cloud expands. And now more neutrons leak out and don't contribute to the chain reaction. Safety is one of the most important reasons to consider very seriously molten salt reactors. And this is because of the clever implementation that was demonstrated in the molten salt reactor experiment. A small port in the bottom of the reactor that was kept plugged. And to keep the port plugged, they had a blower that would blow cool gas over it. So there was a little plug of frozen salt there. Well, if the power went out, the blower turned off and the heat would melt the frozen plug. And guess what? Psh, everything would drain out of the reactor into this drain tank. And the difference between the drain tank and the reactor vessel was the reactor vessel was not meant to lose any thermal energy. The only place you wanted to lose thermal energy was to give it up in the primary heat exchanger. The drain tank, on the other hand, is designed to maximize the rejection of thermal energy to the environment. And I'm a mechanical engineer, so all we ever talked about in school was how to you know, add heat to things and take heat out of things. And one of the hard things about designing a nuclear reactor is designing it to not lose any heat while you're running it because you don't want all that heat to go over to the steam turbine. You don't want to lose a bunch of heat in normal operation, but then to turn around and try to keep it cool if something goes wrong. So there are two conflicting things. The great thing about uh, liquid fluoride reactors is you can design them completely separately. You can say, here's my reactor and it's designed to make heat, and here's my drain tank, and it's designed to cool in all situations. Decades ago, we turned naturally abundant isotopes of uranium and thorium into energy. Shipping Port, a light water breeder, was captured on film. The liquid metal fast breeders were also captured on film. And when you present that to somebody who's been anti-nuclear their whole life, they go, huh? Did you know that? And it's like most, but no, I never knew that. I never, people say, I never knew that. And they think, that's why thorium, like, you, oh, do you know that you could power a reactor with thorium? They go, what's that? 